Um, all right. Um, before I wanted to kind of speak or before we talk about football, I feel like obviously there's something, you know, more important that we need to address uh, before we get to football. Um, obviously the stuff that, that has gone on, um, you know, past week, especially a few days, weekend, um, has been crazy. Um, like, like, you know, many of the community, like the black community, you know, I'm hurt, sad, in pain, um, you know, that we had to watch um, another video of, um, you know, a black man being murdered and watching him gas and try to get air and say to the cop, I can't breathe and, and, and ask, um, you know, basically asking for life. That's not something that I, you know, you, you ever get used to. Um, you know, so I want to say I support the protesters. Um, you know, I understand um, the message. I understand why, what's going on, what's happening. I feel like it's important, especially um, sitting here with you guys in media. You guys play, I think, a pretty big role in what's going on right now because you guys um, play a part in the narrative. And so, um, you know, over the years, we have always talked to you about um, – you know, you guys being able to control the narrative and say um, what's really going on. And so, you know, I feel like a lot of focus is on, you know, the rioting, the, um, the looting, the people stealing stuff. Um, but we're not talking enough about what started that. You know, I think the black community is tired of seeing the same things going on and not seeing the change. And, uh, you know, I think we're tired of seeing people not being held accountable for the actions that they do. But understanding if we were in that position, we would be held accountable. And so, um, you know, I challenge everybody on this call um, to do your part and report um, the media and report the message um, and what it really is. And, it's, it, you know, we're tired of seeing black people getting killed. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm, I'm having conversations with people and, you know, somebody said, man, you know what, I'm afraid to have Child. I'm afraid to have a black child because I don't know how they're going to be treated in this world based off their skin color. That's not something that anybody, that's not a position anybody should be in. Um, you know, I don't have all the answers and I don't even know if what I'm saying is coming out um, perfect. But I do know that, you know, we need to educate ourselves, you know, on both sides. You know, I feel like, um, you know, white people need to educate themselves on what the, what the black experience is like. You know, there's a lot of, there's, there's not, you know, we look at the media, you know, media is a lot, is, is really white, but there's some black media. And, you know, I think it's important to have a conversation with them to understand what are some of the things they go on, because it's just as important for y'all to understand who you're working with, the things that they have to deal with. Um, you know, football is a um, special place because we get to be around all walks of life, white, black, um, you know, people from Canada, You know, all over. So be exposed to those things. So I challenge you guys to educate yourselves on, you know, what it's like to be black in America. And, um, you know, I definitely feel like we have to educate ourselves as well because there's a lot of things that they're not teaching us in schools. There's a lot of things that we are not learning in schools, you know, um, and uh, we need to figure out why that is. You know, everybody is supposed to be getting the same education, but we all know that's not the case. And, you know, we need to fix that. You know, what's the point in having a camera and watching someone murder someone if they're not going to be held accountable for their actions? And so, um, you know, I feel like this is a very interesting time right now. I feel like a lot of people are listening, um, especially in the white community, maybe. I'm not sure. But um, I think it's important that you try to get that knowledge. And I think that it's important that you reach out to your fellow black members in the media to try to get that knowledge. Because um, they always say, you know, knowledge is power. And I believe that, but I also believe that um, the ability to use and apply that knowledge is where the true power comes. So what's good, what's good in having knowledge if you ain't gonna use it? So use the knowledge, see how you can help 
and you know spread the message. I was there at the, the protest on Saturday, and it was very peaceful. And so you know, some white people started burning up cop cars. And so instead of reporting, um, you know, report the protest, the peaceful side of the protest as well. Report the people that are doing good, because there's a lot of people that's doing good out there. And there's a lot of people that want to see the world change and don't want to see the world like this anymore. We want to feel good to have our kids in this world. And, you know, it has to mean something to you guys. You know, I feel like um, it don't really hit home until it happens to you. So, you know, in the media, man, I know I, I you know, I can't see everybody on this, on this, um, you know, Zoom call, but I would go out on a limb and say, y'all rock with me. I, I'm pretty sure everybody on this call rock with me. So imagine if I was that person, you know, being having a uh, knee today, they neck. How would you feel? You know, we don't need like it don't need to happen to someone close to you for you to feel that way. And so, um, yeah, I just urge everybody to educate themselves. I urge everybody to you know figure out what we can do to make this better. I don't have all the answers. Um, I'm hurting and pissed off like everybody else. Um, I'm tired like everybody else. And, you know, I want to see, you know, something different, uh, but it's going to take some leadership. We don't have that leadership right now. We have somebody in the office that is um, calling black protesters thugs and white protesters good people. And that's not okay. And as white people, y'all need to check that. You know what I'm saying? That's on y'all to check that. We can only check it so much. It got to mean something to you. So, um, yeah, man, I think that's that's kind of what I had on my heart. Hopefully that came out how I wanted it to come out. And, uh, you know, we could talk about football. Thanks, Bobby. Chris Francis, do you have a question? You on mute? Bob Kondota? Um, hey, Bobby, what, what was your experience at the, uh, you mentioned being at the protest on Saturday. That was here in Seattle, or what was your experience there? Um, yeah, um, it, was, it was very peaceful. Everything was peaceful um, until uh, there was a white person that threw something at the cops, and they start fighting, or they start um, tear gassing everybody. And then I watched, um, you know, a group of white ind individuals destroy a cop car and set it on fire. And I watched, you know, black people try to stop them from doing that, but, um, you know, it, it just wasn't happening. And then it got to a point where I felt like it was unsafe for me to be there, so I left. Mike DeGar. Mike DeGar. Um, what's up, Bobby? Uh, real quick, to, to Bobby's point, if it, I can't speak for Femi, Ventress, or Ben or anybody, but if anybody does, all my white colleagues, if y'all want to reach out to me, my line's open. You guys know how to get to me. Call me, text me. If you guys want to talk about anything, I'm, I'm here for sure. Uh, I just want to put that out there, especially piggybacking off what Bobby said. Um, Bobby, to you, have you had any uh, convos that uh, you're talking about with any of your white teammates or just white colleagues around the NFL? If so, how has that gone? Do you think that's been productive and how do you think those can help? Um, I definitely had, you know, some conversations with a lot of, um, you know, of my white teammates. Um, I feel like our organization has always done a, a, a great job of just being open to having the conversation, especially Pete, um, you know, being open to having that conversation. I feel like those conversations are going well. Um, and I feel like, you know, a lot of it is, you know, People just, they don't, um, they don't experience it. It's not a, you know, experience that they live in. So until you, you know, understand what the black experience it is, you have to educate yourself. And so, you know, you can have a guy like Cody Barton who goes to Utah, lived in Utah all his life. There's not that many black people out there. Um, if any, I went to school in Utah. There's not that many black people out there. So um, it's, it's a different feeling. And so I think it's just um, taking that initiative and, and, and trying to gain some awareness into, um, you know, what it's like and what we make, what, what fears do we have and what things are we thinking about, um, you know, when we kind of go out into this world. I got well, what, one extra question for you away from the, the protests and, and stuff. Uh, Laramie Tunsil, when he signed his deal, uh, his extension this uh, offseason, he mentioned that he talked to you, I think, about it before he negotiated. 
his own deal. I know you talked to like Russell Okun before yours and talked to Sherman, guys like that. Uh, what power do you think there is in like you guys helping each other um, to do something like that? I think it's, it's, um, it's so much power. And, you know, I think, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, trying to get out of this mindset of feeling like you have to be the only one. Um, you know, I think we want to see other people succeed and we want to see other people um, understand the business that we're in because this business has not been too kind to us. And so, um, you know, I feel it's going to help us a lot. I think, you know, whether guys choose to have agents or not, I think just the, the dialogue and the conversation is going to um, force them to educate themselves and be knowledgeable of things that they could be taken advantage of if, um, you know, if they don't, because I think a lot of the times the reason why we go broke and the reason why um, we are put in this position that we in is, is because we don't truly understand the business. And, you know, we, we come from not having any money to having a lot of it and don't understand how to keep it. And so we have to keep educating ourselves on, um, you know, what we need to do to keep the money that we gain so we can uh, spread it out over our communities and, um, you know, spread it out to our kids. Thanks, Bobby. Appreciate it. Corbin Smith. Hi, Bobby. You mentioned the emphasis on educating people right now. As a former high school history teacher, I always felt like the curriculum wasn't designed to be compatible with that kind of study. What would you like to see done in terms of, you know, with schools trying to educate people so that we can fix this issue moving forward? Um, I think we should try or we have to try to um, educate our youth, especially on the truths. You know what I mean? There's a lot of things that we we're teaching in school that is not necessarily true. And so we can start with that. You know, you got to teach truth. You got to teach, you know, what actually happened in the past. And you know, you have, you have to teach more than just one person's truth because there's multiple different truths on many different um, facets. And so that's definitely something that I feel like we have to, uh, to do. And then, you know, as far as, um, you know, in the inner cities, you know, we have to teach them things that, you know, we don't teach. I know for sure in, you know, the public schools, they teach them something small like writing a check. You know, something small is writing a check. And, um, in the inner cities, we not taught that. You taught to survive. You taught to work for someone versus, uh, you know, owning something. And so I feel like we need to um, better equip our youth with better knowledge. Thank you. Before we get to the uh, next question, I'm gonna just pause y'all real quick because my computer about to die. And so I wanna make sure it don't die on y'all. So I'll be right back, two seconds. Are we good? My bad. All right, we'll kick it back off with Greg Bell. Bobby, hi, good to see you again. We've talked about this, these issues, as you know, for a few years now, maybe not at this intensity across the country, but is there, have you seen any evidence through some of the statements you've made, your teammates, um, sitting or standing or staying in the locker room during national anthems have you seen any change over the years in empathy or people who are putting themselves in the black person's shoes and, and learning have we have we come anywhere in the last three years um i i can sit here and say that you know obviously there has been some movement but um it's not enough you know in my opinion uh because um, I feel like if you screenshot this moment right now and go back in time and play it, I don't know if it looks any different. You know, there's a, there, you have, um, 
the NBA where you got Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, several other players that were, were wearing um, a shirt that said, I can't breathe. And, and I don't know exactly what date that happened. Um, you know, some years ago and you fast forward to right now and there's still, there was still, you know, someone who was pleading for their life and saying they can't breathe. And that was unheard and that was dismissed. And ultimately we saw a person die on camera. And I don't think that's something that we should ever get used to seeing. You know what I mean? Like just imagine, you know what I mean? Like imagine growing up, imagine when we was growing up, like, and you know, I'm not, I'm not as old as y'all, no offense, but um, imagine growing up and you watching TV and all the censors that they had. You know, you couldn't say cuss words, you couldn't say this, you couldn't say that. Now fast forward to right now, where you got kids from all ages that got Instagram. All they gotta do is scroll and they see a death. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want that to be something that we get used to. And I don't want that to be something that uh, we get comfortable with. And I don't want that to be something that um, people feel like that's okay. It's not okay. And I think that's the reason why everybody's upset because it, you know, we, we've seen this, this uh, before, you know, um, someone, someone does a killing, you capture it on tape and they don't get off or they get off because of whatever law that they have. And so that's why I feel like we need to really educate ourselves on the laws, on economics, on finances, on different things that affect um, ourselves and um, do better. You call on white people to educate and to vote and leaders to help you vote in leaders who listen to the message. Do you see leaders out there locally, nationally that can make that change, even if we voted them in? Um, I don't necessarily have uh, people in mind per se. Um, I feel like, um, you know, there just has to be, you know, raised awareness in my opinion of, um, you know, what's going on. It has to mean something to you because, you know, we, we, we sit on here, right? And something like this happens and we, you know, do the post on Instagram, we write our, you know, we put out our messages, we write our messages, everybody is sincere, everybody is, is, is um, you know, understanding of the situation. And then after a week or two, everything kind of goes back to status quo for everybody else, but not for, you know, black people. They still have those images in their head. They still have those, those thoughts. They still have those fears of worrying and thinking could that have been me? And so, um, you know, that's why I say I really feel like people just need to understand everybody's experience, especially the black experience, because it hasn't been great. And, and sorry for the quick shift of football here, it's less meaningful, as you said. When they drafted Jordan Brooks, do you take that as an opportunity to mentor a young kid? What do you, at this point in your career, how do you, what, what do you go, what do you do with them? Um, I mean, same thing I do all the time. I mean, I, it's, it's the, um, you know, it's the same thing. If y'all look back and y'all listen to what I've said over the years, I've always been trying to, i um, always been wanting to give away knowledge to anybody that comes and asks for the knowledge. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, this is bigger than just football to me. This is, you know, um, young men getting you know, a chance to live out their dream and provide for their family. And that's how I see it. And so I don't really, you know, see it the way everybody else sees it. So I'm not gonna sit here and just, you know, not speak to him, not whatever. I want him to be as successful as possible. I want him to do as great as possible. And I'm excited um, to have him. And I think it's gonna be, you know, really fun um, to do. And I think as a um, older player, um, you know, I feel like I want to see the guys do better you know, from every aspect, whether it's on the field and off the field. You know, like I said, there's a crazy statistic and I don't know if it's true or I don't know, you know, where they got it from or where the, the, the thing comes from, but I've seen it firsthand, you know, players come in and they don't leave what they came in with. And so if I can help players come in and leave with 
more than they came with, and I feel like I, I did a good job of, of leading. Thank you. Thanks for your message, Bobby. No problem. Art? Um, Bobby, um, in September of 2017, you and the Seahawks were flying to Memphis when you uh, got word that President Trump called NFL players who knelt sons of bitches and recommended their firing. You guys organized a protest on that Saturday and, and, and stayed in um, the locker room on Sunday. Looking back on that, do you think that had an influence on the NFL and its fans, or are you disappointed that here we are where we are right now? Um, honestly, I, I really don't care about Trump. And I don't care what he has to say. Um, he has shown to be a very uh, divisive individual. He has shown where he stands on people who don't look like him. And so um, anything that he says now or that he plans to say, uh, I really um, don't care. As far as um, what we did back then, and do I feel like it affected anything? I feel like it, it um, you know, created an awareness and created a conversation. Um, but the changes that uh, we want to see and, and that we that we would like to see um, is not going to happen overnight and it's not going to be done by just, um, you know, just us, you know, especially in the black community. So um, it's going to take more um, than, than what we've done to to change. But at the same time, too, um, it's going to take better leadership, you know, as long as he's in office and, and being a divisive person that he is. Um, he's going to invite the people who think like him and make them feel comfortable and what they're doing is okay. Uh, related, um, a couple of years ago, you had a chance to talk with um, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar when he was in Seattle promoting his book, Writings on the Wall. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what you uh, took, uh, took from his history in the civil rights movement and social justice and police reform uh, in that conversation? What, do, what lingers with you as far as his historical perspective? Um, he's just, man, he's a very inspiring person for sure. You know, he's had so much wisdom. I think the thing that sticks out to me is, um, you know, I think sometimes as, you know, I don't know how old I was when I went there, but um, we sometimes don't see what the older athletes had to go through for us to be in the position that we're in right now. And so, you know, it really challenged me to go back and really try to understand, um, you know, what they went through to get some of the things that they got and what can I do um, to better that um, and help in any way. So I think, you know, listening to him and seeing him inspired me to um, be more active than I was in the community and figuring out, you know, better ways than just, you know, maybe hosting a football camp or, um, you know, doing some of the things that we do, not saying that they aren't great, but doing some of the things that um, impact on kids because that's what we want to do is try to really, you know, help the youth um, not have to go through what we went through and what they went through. Thanks. Aaron Fentress. Hey, Bobby. Uh, first of all, thanks for reminding some of us how much older we are than you. I appreciate that. But to that end, uh, I, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s. My dad was born in the late 40s. And he would tell me stories about his run-ins with police as a young man in Chicago. And those stories would resonate with me in the 70s and 80s. And now here we are 40 years from when he was telling me those stories from 70 years ago. So it's still the same thing. Did you as a kid growing up have someone telling you stories about their dealings with police as well that maybe resonated with you as you moved forward in your life? Um, I've, you know, I, I had a lot of people kind of tell me, um, you know, what, you know, what potential could happen. I think, you know, as you know, I uh, feel like, especially people in the black community, that's actually an education piece. Like, I feel like you have to have a conversation with your son 
on how to um, deal with police officers because there's a chance that you know he might do that. He might be in that position and you don't want him to make the wrong decision because he could get killed. And so I feel like that's a conversation that I feel I would, well, I would go out on a limb and say about 90 to plus uh, percent black people have to have that conversation. Um, you know, I think the conversation around when I was growing up was more um, the racial profiling. Um, you know, my, my parents kind of feared uh, when I was walking um, on the street that because, you know, we dressed a certain way that they can um, mistake me for someone who just committed a crime. And so um, we were very conscious of that. Um, you know, I went to school in Utah and um, it was a very uh, eye-opening experience for me. Um, and, you know, it's just a conversation that we have to have because I remember um, specifically um, we were in camp and a police officer came uh, to speak to us and kind of mention that Logan, Utah is one of the um, nicest, safest places in America and that they don't have much to do. So if they can get you for jaywalking, they will try to get you from jaywalking. And if you are black, and this is his words, if you are black and you stole something or did something, we know to look at the sports teams first because we know that's where a lot of them are. And that's what he said. And so, um, yeah, man, you just have to have a, you know, you have to be taught an awareness and have to be able to deal with certain things that may come about. And then I have a football question as well. Uh, LJ Collier spoke the other day. Um, how important is it for you guys to, you know, get him to perform like a first round pick? And what did you see in him last year that maybe gives you hope that he will turn the corner and be very productive this season? That was my thing, man. I never really, um, I don't really pay attention to the, the pick stuff in my opinion, because, especially for me, because I've been, um, you know, I've been in a situation where you saw, um, you know, guys who get drafted in the first round, you guys saw guys who get drafted in the fifth round, and, you know, Sherman Cam are an example of that, uh, where they come out and they perform. And so I never really talked to them from the perspective of being a first round pick. It was more from, you know, how can we help you perform to the level that you can perform at? And, you know, there was a little bit of conversation about the first round pick, but it was more so just don't let the pressures of being a first round pick um, weigh on you and make this game not fun. You know, there's a lot of pressure on, you know, people when they come in, especially as a first round pick, you are supposed to, um, you are supposed to perform at a certain level because they rated you a certain way. And that's not the case. Everybody learns differently. Everybody grows differently. Everybody experiences things differently. And so, um, honestly, I've just been trying to give him my support and, and, and know he's working hard and know he's, uh, you know, I think he's very, very passionate about, uh, you know, being out there on the field and really making an impact. And, you know, I want to do everything I can in my power to help him do that. Um, you know, I understand maybe um, the first year didn't go as well as everybody would think, but it's kind of like, all right, forget what they say. You know, you got to prove it to yourself and, and you know, play like you know you're capable of playing, and all of that will be taken care of. Thanks, Bobby. Masvida? Yep. Hey, Bobby, how you doing, man? Doing good. Good. Hey, um, what, what message would you say to the youth in terms of the – I know you've talked about the education, but from an emotionalism perspective, because if you're 17, 18, or whatever right now, you've got so many emotions going through you, what message would you have for them? I would say it's okay. It's okay to have those emotions. I think a lot of the times it's like, you know, people can 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 talk about the um, the riot and the things of that nature. Now, you know, all of them are not for the right reasons, but you know, people are angry and people are frustrated and people, um, you know, have a right to to be able to express those frustrations. Um, you know however they feel, you know, sometimes it's not right, but um, that's the point of life, right? Learning, you know, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to do things that you, um, you know, you could have been better. You know, if everybody was perfect, then 
we wouldn't be in this position in the first place. So um, I say for them, man, just just understanding that um, it's okay to feel that way, uh, really channel that energy and try to, you know, put it into something positive and, um, you know, try to reach out and look to your, your, your leaders and people that are older to you and help them, you know, guide you um, through this because it's not easy and it's not um, something that we um, want to get used to. It's almost like, man, we forgot COVID-19 was a thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, it's, it's crazy what's going on and, and it's frustrating, but, you know, we have people that want to help you get through it. And, you know, I got to ask you, what book or audio book are you listening to from the context of, you know, where are you finding that, that balance right now? Uh, what am I reading? I'm listening to Kevin Hart's book. I'm a, I, I love the way, um, I love Kevin Hart's, um, positive energy. So I'm listening to that. Um, I'm reading about, uh, Reginald Lewis, um, uh, who's one of the first black billionaires that I don't feel like people talk about enough. Um, and I think those are two really good places to start. Thanks, man. No problem. Brady Henderson. Hi, Bobby. Um, I was going to ask you about your experience at Utah when you told us um, that story. Did you have any other experiences there that um, validated what the what the, the the message you heard from the police officer or anything that really stood out outside of, of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was multiple. Um, you know, there there was multiple um, things that I encountered. Um, I, I don't really care to go into them. I guess one of them um, would be, um, I'm trying to put this in the greatest way, but uh, I got pulled over one time and um, they said it was for my tent, but I didn't have any tent. Um, but I was driving a car that wasn't mine, but it was a very nice car. And um, they were confused to how I got my hands on um, this nice of a car. And um, I, I would like to say they weren't believing me until they found out I was a, a football player at Utah State. And then the conversation changed. And so, um, you know, I think I saw a tweet Sharon put out where sometimes, you know, the thing that we do uh, kind of affects us, you know, because we're football players, um, you know, people see us differently, but, you know, we still are scared as everybody else. We still have those thoughts and feelings as everybody else. We still go through those things um, as everybody else. Not as much, I guess, maybe, um, but, you know, you fear for it because what if I wasn't a football player? You know, what would happen? I don't know. And, you know, something you think about. Do you hear people when you speak out on things like that? Do you hear people trying to minimize what you're saying because they say that well your experience as a professional athlete isn't the same? Um, you get that sometimes. Um, you know, you get sometimes, and, and people you know try to you know minimize what you you. But um, you know, I'm not really saying this for people to like for their opinion. I don't really care about their opinion. I'm just trying to you know, um, share some information that I experienced, share my experience. And so you have one of two things, you can either listen or not listen. And, um, you know, you see we're not listening as guys. Thank you. Larry Stone. Hi, Bobby. Um, I was wondering if you think people will now have a new perspective on Colin Kaepernick and, and do you hope that people maybe now understand better what he was trying to say and the message he was trying to get across? Um, I hope people have a new perspective on, um, you know, what Colin was trying to do. Um, because again, you know, you see with this situation, um, when you look on the TV right now and you see what's on the news, they're just showing you people who are, um, stealing, showing people who are, you know, damaging different areas, things of that nature, but they don't really talk about what caused these people to feel this way. And so when you look at Colin, I mean, I think when he spoke about it, maybe it wasn't perfect, but he put out the message on why he was doing this and what he was doing this for and what he wanted to see. 
but yet somehow it turned into um, being solely about the flag. And, you know, from jump, it was never about that. He's even, you know, gone and said, hey, look, I went to the military and I asked him, what can I do to display my unhappiness with what's going on in this world right now? And so he took the time to educate himself. He took the time to talk to the people that it could offend to make sure they weren't offended. And still, that was the only thing that we talk about. Because even when we talk back about what was going on during that time, the first thing that comes out of people's mouths are the flag. It was never really about that. It was about situations like this and situations that happened way before this, where um, the black community is not being treated fairly. And the people that are harming the black community is not being held accountable. And so um, I, I support him then, I support him now. Jimmy? Hey, Bobby, hope all is well, given the circumstances. Uh, my question is, what advice or message would you have to the people who maybe they're just so afraid of the mere thought of race that they just kind of turn the cheek or they might not harbor any racist thoughts or have any intentional actions or anything like that, or they use the classic line of, I don't see race. What kind of advice or, or message would you have to those people? Um, I would say have a conversation with a uh, black community. And if that doesn't necessarily change your perspective, then, you know, maybe check yourself and see if you open to um, hearing that. Because, you know, everybody can say those different things and everybody can have their opinion, but to me, I don't really feel like you can fully, like you can fully have that opinion without having a conversation with a community that um, sees things differently. And that's the whole thing. Like everybody, I think everybody right now, like kind of wants to be um, right or wants to have everybody agree with them. But we don't all see the things the same. We don't all agree with everybody's perspective. But the point is, is not whether you agree or disagree, but are you listening to the perspective? Are you hearing what someone has to say? Like, do you, are you taking the time to listen to what people have to say and not just thinking about what you're gonna say next or thinking about how you can be right? Um, you know, so I think, you know, if you do have that opinion, I'm not saying it's right, wrong, or different, I challenge you if you haven't already to have a conversation with people that feel differently than you. Joe Fan. Hey, Bobby, I think um, during times like this, there's a lot of focus put on teams and brands, um, you know, and I think everyone's quick to put a statement out, but I think a, a lot of the sentiment is that those statements can be, you know, empty and hollow. Um, you work with a number of different partners. Um, I'm curious if you have conversations with with organizations you work with and, and maybe just in general, what would you like to see from, you know, corporate America or, you know, teams or organizations to where, you know, maybe it's beyond, you know, writing a check and saying thoughts and prayers or, or what, what it, will it take to maybe take a next step in your eyes? Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly. Um, um, what's the necessary step? Because like you said, a lot of the times, you know, um, organization kind of throws some money at the, the, the thing and, and it doesn't necessarily kind of change, um, you know, what's going on. But that's not to say that their intent is not good. There's not to say that they're not trying. I mean, you know, we understand that you're, you're trying, but I think it's, it's um, you know, actually coming and figuring out what can you do to truly have an impact, you know what I mean? Let's, um, you know, take the NFL, for example. Um, I, I don't know exactly, so don't quote me on this, but I would say there's about, what, three or four black head coaches. And, um, you know, they were talking about putting out a um, thing that basically incentivized um, organizations to, um, to hire minorities, uh, black people of color. And, you know, that, that, in my opinion, that mere thought, let's like sometimes let people know that maybe you are not hiring based off ability like you should. That's kind of what I thought when I saw that. Um, 
you know, I think that there are a lot of capable people doing jobs that they're not getting the opportunity. So maybe the, what the corporations can do is give people that are highly qualified that don't look like them an opportunity because, um, you know, I think that would go a long way. Uh, but for me, I'm just trying to figure out a way to um, impact the community, figure out the way to um, own things so I can be the person in charge of giving those opportunities out. And so that's kind of where my focus is at. And then one quick football follow-up. Uh, as you kind of sit back and see what the moves have been made in free agency and the draft and um, you know, as you look at things on paper and knowing the, the pieces that are in place, you know, what gives you some optimism that, that your defense um, will be able to take a step forward? I know, you know, the clowny name is still out there and that's still a big kind of question mark of how this thing will play out. But um, kind of given where things are, how do you view things uh, on your on your side of the football? Um, I think we're hungry. I think, um, you know, I think we can look back defensively. Um, um, from last year and, and really know that we didn't play to a level that we, we could have played. And we don't want to lower the standard. The standard is set. And we want to make sure that we um, reach that standard and, and push that standard up. And so I think, you know, I plan on being better. I feel like our defense plans on being better. Um, I feel like um, that gives us a lot of optimism. And obviously my experience in the league, um, you guys have been here. We've had multiple seasons where um, our defenses, if you look at them on paper, where you sit there and you go down the list and say, oh, this defense should perform like this. And we don't necessarily perform to that expectation. So um, how things look on paper is just paper. But until we kind of get out there and, you know, practice together, be around one another and, um, grow. That's kind of where you you get everything. Because even you know having somebody like Q Diggs is, you know, for a whole season, um, you know, will change things. And and that's just one example. So, um, you know, I think we have great leadership. I think we are hungry. And you know, personally, I can't wait to get back out there on the field and um, do what we always been doing. Thanks, Bob. John Boyle. Yeah, hey, Bobby, you guys a few years ago launched the Equality and Justice for All Action Fund. You've given out a ton of grants and now just announced, you know, another $500,000 contribution is coming. So what have you guys seen come out of that in the last few years? And, and what's the goal of these next grants? Um, I can't speak directly on that because I don't know um, everything um, to that. I think Doug um, did an amazing job with that. And he was um, in the loop with kind of building that. Um, but I definitely feel like we're just trying to figure out a way to, you know, impact our community in a meaningful way. Um, you know, do it in a way where, uh, the money that is being given is providing real change and, um, helping people, um, you know, that are affected by things like this. So, um, again, I can't speak too much, um, on it. I can only speak about, you know, the things that I do. Um, so yeah. Tim Booth. Hey Bobby, got a couple for you. Um, you, you touched briefly on your experience Saturday going down to the, to the protest. Why was it, I mean, you could have put out a statement and, and gone that route. Why was it so important for you to go down and be a part of that? Um, I just feel like I wanted to feel, um, the energy, you know, I wanted to see for myself, you know, I felt like there was things being portrayed on, um, on the internet and things like that. And I just wanted to see it firsthand for myself. And, um, I could have put out a statement, but I did this instead. You know what I mean? Um, they, you know, they came to ask me like, Hey, we want you to kind of come on and talk. And kind of when everything was happening, it was like, oh, man, let's do it on Wednesday or, third or Friday, let everything die down. And I was like, nah, we can do it on Monday. That could be my statement. So y'all got my statement, y'all know how I feel. Um, so if I don't, you know, put out a message or I don't put something on social media, cause I'm really not like social media guy. I might like a photo here and there, but um, 
you know, I try to communicate with my words and let y'all see the energy behind my words. So not saying that what people are doing are bad and then putting the message in. I think it's dope. There's a lot of people that spoke up that wouldn't have. Um, so it's just my way of doing things. And then you mentioned how kind of COVID has become a little bit of an afterthought with everything that's gone on in the past week. Um, but it's still a front and center thing that, that everyone's going to have to deal with. What is your feelings about the virus as, as talk continues of teams returning to headquarters and what could a season be like with knowing kind of that, how a locker room is and how things like the flu can sometimes just kind of run rampant through a, a locker room. How much of a concern is, is the COVID uh, virus going into a season? I mean, you definitely have to pay attention to it because it's real. It's not something that you can um, run away from or not something that you can hide from. Um, it's going to make the, the season a little interesting. Uh, we don't know how interesting. Um, but honestly, I'm just kind of living in the moment, in my opinion. Um, because if you take a snapshot for, what, a couple months ago, we didn't even think that um, anything was going to be open, let alone places like California. You saw, um, I believe, uh, all the LA teams were trying to figure out where they were going to play because California released a statement basically saying that they weren't going to see any large gatherings um, until something like November or something like that. Now, you know, take a snapshot of today. Um, they talked about opening things June 1st. So um, we're kind of in a unique position um, as the league because we are see we haven't necessarily missed our season. Um, if you sit here and talk to guys like myself or anybody else, like we don't really, you know, off season is cool is to get around everybody else, but we, we aren't too crazy about it. So um, for us, we're not really missing too much. Um, but, you know, when we start getting into training camp, when we start getting into, um, you know, the season, that's kind of where we, you know, tend to make, might think a little bit more about it. But um, at the end of the day, it's just being clean. I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, when you when they first released the statement about COVID-19, one of the things was wash your hands. And everybody was like, oh, my God, that's so great. I'm going to start doing that. And I'm just asking, what was you doing before they told you to wash your hands? Um, so um, I think it's just doing the little thing that you are like you already should be doing. I hope you're taking a shower. I hope you wash your hands and don't be all up in everybody's face. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. All right, and the last one from Curtis Crabtree. Hey, Bobby. I, I was just kind of curious as you spoke throughout this year. How, how frustrating is it just in general, whether it's Kaepernick's cause being kind of co-opted by people pointing to the flag and military aspects or these protests here being kind of overshadowed by looters and rioters and stuff, that the messages keep getting watered down because of the actions of people on the fringes and trying to – kind of co-op the message that the people are trying to say. How frustrating is that just in general? Oh, uh, it's really frustrating. Um, obviously, people, like, you're really frustrated. You get really frustrated with, you know, people trying to basically hijack the, 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 the main cause and what's truly important. And so it's frustrating, um, but I think the thing that we try to do is we try to – um, you know, especially for you guys um, and the media in general is understanding what's going on. So you understand, you know, what people are trying to do to, um, you know, basically sway away from the message. And what you guys can do is keep putting a eye on what's really going on. So every time somebody riots, every time somebody's loitering or whatever they're doing, you still bring back the main topic and what started all of this. You can talk about, you know, what you're saying, but, you know, still bring back the main message. You know what I mean? Still talk about things the way that you should talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, um, I saw, I saw a clip um, today actually, uh, where there was somebody stealing from there was someone stealing from a Target or something like that. And this was a black person. And they were talking about how, I can't believe it. This is bad. They're, they shouldn't be doing this. It's terrible. Don't do that. But then the same situation, and it was a white woman, and she had a lot of stuff. And they said, 
Um, you know, look at her, she's taking things, but we think that she might be an employee. And so just though, like that little perspective, like you can change the whole narrative. Like why wasn't the other person that was taken, why couldn't they be an employee? You know what I mean? So just really, you know, being conscious of the message that you're pushing, being conscious of, you know, how you talking about black people versus how you talking about other people is important. And I think just, no matter how much they try to distract you from what's going on, being able to still get back to what's the original cause and, you know, what's the original thing? Because, you know, when I sit and I watch, you know, all these videos that everybody's watching, you know, I'm seeing so many people get arrested. I'm seeing so many people get tased. I'm seeing so many people get tear gassed. And I'm sitting here saying to myself, man, if they would have just arrested the four cops that did this, none of this would have happened. And if they would have had that same energy with the people that they are arresting now because they are not happy with how things are going, um, you know, how would this have played out? So, you know, I think the people want justice. I think they want uh, the men that were involved in this killing to be held accountable. And, you know, we're gonna wait and see and hopefully this time around, um, something different happens. And a quick football one is, uh, what's it like to have Bruce back? Uh, it's great. I love, you know, I love having Bruce back. I, mean, I was excited to have him back. I think he mentioned one time we were texting and talking about um, him possibly coming back. And I was just like, man, watch, it's going to happen. I, just, I, just said, I felt in my heart that it was going to happen. The opportunity was going to come, and it came. And so it's really cool to have the people that you came in with uh, back, um, the people that understood um, – you know, what we did, you know, to kind of get to the the height that we got as a defense to have another person to be able to um, share that experience. And, you know, just having another beast, man, just having another baller, having another dog, you know, watching. I've, I've always watched his games, you know, since he's left and, and he's gotten better and better and better, um, you know, over the years. You know, he's had years where he's led the league in, in fumbles. He's had, you know, career high in sacks. And so... I'm excited to be able to be a part of helping him still grow and being a part of watching him still grow. And um, it's going to be a fun room for sure. Thanks, Bobby. We're going to give Aaron Levine a question real quick. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, uh, thanks, Lane. Uh, Bobby, in what ways have the current circumstances and what happened over the weekend uh, been addressed in a team setting, if at all, uh, and virtually the last couple of days? Um, you know, like I said, Coach Carroll is, is very um, aware of the things that are going on. So um, today we did not speak about football. We focused on what was going on um, in the world and we gave anybody an opportunity to express their feelings, express their emotions and um, express their anger and, and whatever it was that they're feeling. Um, because at the end of the day, like, you know, life is, is bigger than football. You know, there's a lot of things that are, that are happening that are bigger than football. And so, um, you know, he provided an opportunity for guys to to speak about um, the things that they saw, the things that they're dealing with, you know, what it's like um, in the city that they're in, because everybody's city is handling this, um, you know, differently. You know, what can we do to help? What can we do to to kind of, you know, keep, you know, everybody um, and so we kind of just had that conversation. I think it's dope because, you know, a lot of people don't get to be able to express those emotions and those feelings. And, you know, to have a platform and to have a, a situation where we could do that, um, I felt it was great. Um, because like I said, it's it's a, it's a bigger than football. You know what I mean? I, I don't know how you guys felt, but it was kind of hard for me to focus on football or focus on anything other than what was going on. Because if you looked up from whatever you were doing, um, all you saw was what was happening. And, um, you know, made it tough. So being able to speak about it was definitely helpful. And I, you know, I'm grateful that, you know, we have an organization that understands it. Thanks, Bobby. All right, guys. Thank you, Bobby. Thanks for your time. And uh, thanks for your thoughtful words. Appreciate you guys. Be safe. Wash your hands. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby.